So I'm going to do hide control. The worksheet is here. Oh, you can also show this. So this sheet they have printed out. So it's just going to be a pain in the neck, but hopefully we'll get through it. And if not everyone's through it, at some point we're going to be like, we're going to keep going. Yeah. There'll be a long tail, and we'll be like, we'll send students around. I'm going to be running in and out to get the food, but um, I'll be like, uh, do you want to ring the bell? Or do it works, so I think it's And I bought it for a person who was talking about it. Welcome back, everyone. Well, we're just getting started. That was such an awesome conversation that was just getting going there. We totally want to engage in that, but there's more parts of the Data 8 magic that we want to share with you. And potentially, one of the most magic parts of the Data 8 whole thing is the totally awesome students that make it happen. And there are just, it's such a great organization to be part of. Year after year, awesome people come and be part of it. And we have Carlos and Ciara here uh, to lead us into the lab. So I'm going to turn it over to you guys. And bear with us. The idea is that you, you will be doing the lab on your laptops, and it will be a little fiddly to get us in there, but everybody, like, let's work together and help the people at your table. Uh, look for the instructions on your table, um, and let's let's help each other get into the lab. Hi, everyone. So some quick introduction. I'm Carlos. See if I can right here. There you go. I'm Carlos. I recently just graduated from Berkeley this May. Um, I, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so some quick introduction as to how I actually ended up here. So I, summer of 2019, I had just finished my freshman year of college, still no clue, just took some CS classes, and then I took Data 8, fell in love with the course, and decided to stick with it. And if I'm quite honest with you, it was probably one of the most, like, highlight experience of, like, my life here at Berkeley. Um, there's a lot of opportunities here at data science, especially since it's growing at such a rapid pace. I was able to join student teams. When I found out I was actually able to teach my own peers, like I felt empowered to do that and inclined to do so. So I did decide to pursue that. Um, now that I graduated, I am thankful that I will be working as a data scientist over there in Los Angeles. And yeah, I'm excited to be back here for the weekend um, and teach you all some data science. Oh, question? Sorry, what was your degree in? Uh, data science. Data science. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Ciara. I'm a third year, or sorry, actually a fourth year now. So I'm the year behind Carlos. I'll be studying data science and economics. Um, and I really love that you can use data science and economics. And I love that aspect about it. Like Carlos, I took data eight. Um, in the year of 2019, I believe fall 2019. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so like Carlos, I actually took data eight in 2019. I actually took it in fall 2019. So over the regular school year, um, I ended up working on some student teams as well. Um, instead of working on data eight first, I worked on connector courses, um, which we love. And I also worked with Jupyter modules. Connector courses are basically courses that connect data science or specifically data eight to another topic. So as I mentioned, I'm a data science and econ major. So I worked with a connector course that connected data eight concepts with business applications. Um, so that's another really cool thing that Berkeley does. And then Jupyter modules is um, basically just curriculum development for programs. Um, and connector courses as well. But I started with those two programs and then I worked my way to Data 8. And it has been truly a blessing to be able to talk about Data 8 and introduce Data 8 to my peers as well. Um, I think it's a really amazing course, especially since coding and mathematics and 
kind of merging those two together can be really intimidating. And I think data eight is so amazing and really introduces it well. What is yeah. the preference to student teams? Is that internal to like Berkeley as a campus or is that internal to like the course itself? Yeah, great. So I'll repeat the question for the Zoom poll as well. Um, but the question was this about what this reference to student teams was and whether it was internal to Berkeley or to the class itself. Um, I believe it's internal to Berkeley, but because there is so much overlap with data eight and those connector courses, um, so they're separate courses, they're offered for some number of units as well and have a lecture and things like that. Um, they work heavily together, but I do believe that they are technically separate from data eight, um, but they work really closely together. So um, that's why we consider them connector courses, because you do need data eight knowledge in order to do connector courses. Yeah, another question? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, so you took data eight and uh, the Jupyter notebook and labs and the Python incorporated into course. Uh, did you take data ADA e afterwards as a connector or was it the course connector that you put after? Oh, okay. The connector course that I specifically taught was UGBA 88. Um, I believe it's called Business and Decisions. Um, I did not personally take it myself, but at that point when I started helping out with that course, I had actually already taken a number of upper division econ courses and data science courses, so I didn't really need to take that course. Um, I also took, I believe, STAT 88, so it's statistics in the context of data eight. I also took computer science 88, so um, which is computer science with data science. Um, but I took a lot of connector courses just because I really liked that you can use data science in these different contexts. So those connector courses, do they have the same format? Do you choose the notebook that they're based on Python and they pretty much have the same format? Yeah, so the question was asking if um, the connector courses have the same format. They do have the same format. One of the most intimidating parts about starting data science and computer science is just getting set up. Um, at least for me, my very first lab, I was on the verge of tears because I could not set up my computer. Um, that is the most scary part. Um, if we can expedite that process, and I believe Eric will be talking about that, um, then it makes it a lot easier for students and it makes it a lot easier to get into these fields. Um, but they do follow the same format. It's really helpful to the students um, and it makes it more welcoming. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then in the interest of time, we're going to go ahead and start going over the lab demo. So at Berkeley for data eight specifically, we have two hour labs that generally follow the same structure every week. Um, so the very first hour, is usually a worksheet or a discussion worksheet that's aimed at discussing these concepts um, without a computer. Um, so really just talking about it, learning to think in the context of data science and not necessarily worrying about the coding aspect of it. Um, the second half or the second hour is going to be actually applying that coding. And we're actually trying to code out those concepts. Um, and the reason we do the conceptual part first is just so that students feel more comfortable and are able to think about it without a computer. Again, kind of all of our tests um, and things like that are not using a computer. So it's important that students can think about these things without using a computer. Um, and then we move to a lab. Um, we'll start going over the discussion worksheet part first, um, but just for reference, the lab will be on this very first link here, which I believe is on the sheet that you guys have in the front on your tables. Um, similar to the connector courses, our labs follow the same format as all of our assignments. So again, that makes it easier for students. Now it's being weird. Yeah. I think the mouse thinks you're in Zoom and then it doesn't think you're in. Uh, it's also behind you and on a the piece of paper on the on the table. Oops. Okay.
So uh, we were talking about lab worksheet just before, and maybe you could just do two seconds on the lab worksheet before we jump in. So this is what our lab worksheet looks like. It's a Google document. Um, and I believe it was primarily made by the professors or the people who made the course. And then updates are continually made by um, student instructors. Uh, we'll work on getting the link to this document to you really quickly. Okay. Give me a second. <laughs> Anthony. All right. Um, and then while we're waiting on that link, I'll go over kind of an overview of what this looks like. Um, generally, we start off by having a few conceptual um, statements that are really important to the course. So, for example, we talk about what columns and what rows are. It might seem trivial to students because they already have some intuitive understanding, um, but really emphasizing these points will ensure that students at least think about it or keep it in the back of their minds while they work on the worksheet. Um, we also try to implement example problems. Um, so you see that we have an example table, um, not necessarily just code. It's important to have different aspects with the worksheet. So um, whether you show code, whether you show the end results, or the initial table that we start with. Um, we use a lot of visualizations in our discussion worksheets. Um, we always try to set up a problem or have some sort of context so that it seems like there's an application to the concepts that they use. So you can see here that this one is talking about data aid staff and kind of information that relates to them. I'm sorry, this mouse is. Yeah, it's. I was doing this was work. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I'll stick to that. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yes. Okay, thank you so much. So it is a touch screen. Awesome. Um, so you can see here that we start with an original table or the table that we start with. And then we move to questions about this table. Again, not everything is code. This one is asking true or false questions about whether or not we can make these ending tables from this table. Um, it's not necessarily something we would do in assignments in the real world or on tests, but it is really helpful in terms of gaining that conceptual understanding. Um, so recognizing whether or not this information is even in the table um, is something that we're looking at here. Um, so generally, some student instructors follow different kind of routines. Um, generally, I like to give my students time to work on the problems together um, so that they can facilitate discussion and get used to talking about data science. Um, and then we go over it as a group. Um, and then during this time, I like to try to um, ask them to explain their own answers so that they're hearing it from a student perspective. And then I'll reiterate kind of what they said. Um, finally, we have another practice problem. Again, this one is showing the initial table that we're working with, and then it's working with code. Um, a lot of different ways that you can do code when it comes to discussion worksheets. You can have them kind of find the errors in this code. You can have them interpret what the code is saying. Um, but this is one of the problems that we generally do a lot. Um, and then finally, we ask another conceptual question about association, causal relationship, or something else. Um, but again, these discussion worksheets are really just aimed at getting that conceptual basis. Um, and then once we have this conceptual basis, we move to the lab notebook, which Carlos will talk about. Okay, hi everyone. So 
as Ciara said, we start with the lab worksheet first, mainly to get the conceptual understanding of all of these problems, because a lot of it seems really trivial to, especially as us as instructors, we're like, oh, like working with tables, working with data types, like, oh, this should be really easy for students. But data eight is meant to be introductory. The majority of students who take this course have no prior coding or statistics knowledge, and that's what we always want to assume. So that's why this conceptual background is really important to use other different forms of examples that Ciara mentioned, like, you know, having a table, creating visualizations from that, like, how could we think about this in less terms of code before we actually move on to the code itself? So it's definitely there to set the foundation. One other thing, right, all of these labs are completely led by other, like, student, under, like, undergraduate students. Um, every undergraduate student decides to approach their worksheet a little differently based on their students' needs. So some undergraduate students might want to create slides with these problems and then have answers afterwards. Some undergraduate students might want to do a walkthrough of the worksheet together with their students. Whereas I myself, I like to talk about the problem a little bit, you know, give a one minute insight of it, you know, what could we think about, give the students some time to work together in groups, and then come up with solutions together afterwards so that students are hearing answers from other students. For me, that's typically been the most effective just because I love hearing students' answers, obviously. Um, but also, you know, it gives students the opportunity to like, you know, think, and especially like if you make mistakes along the way, other students probably same, have the same mistakes as you, and that's okay. We need to normalize that a lot more. Okay, so now let's move on to the actual lab notebook. So um, as we talked about, right, so one of the main things about students learning how to code for the first time is a lot of them don't really know how to set up their computer. And Ciara expressed that frustration. I had that myself too when I first started here at Berkeley. However, the great part of like our technology is that students just go to the Data8 website, click the link, and then this pops up, right? So I assume everyone here has been able to open it now correctly. Like, correct. Put your thumbs up yes. if you can open the lab. Awesome. Okay, great. So the lab is specific to you. So let's say you're a student working on this lab. Work on your lab. Make her, make sure you hit like either Control S or Command S if you're using a Mac, and they'll continuously save. Sometimes it auto saves for you. But what's special about these links is that wherever you left off before, if you click that link again, all of your stuff will be loaded again. So that's the great part of working with this. So as our following on from what Professor De Niro was showing us earlier on with the tables demo, now we're basically going to be showing you a tables lab. So this is lab two, which students are introduced to in the second week of data eight. So one of the important aspects is usually the TA or the student undergraduate student instructor is going to read the beginning of it for the students, you know, make sure that they're recalling all of the materials and the resources available to them. So here, when they open up the lab, the first thing that's talked about is how there's the Python reference, which has information. So I can't really highlight it, but if you can see my mouse, it's right here. So if you click on the Python reference sheet, it's going to open you up to the Data8 website. What's great about this is that it's going to open up basically every single tool, every single concept, or every single thing that's going to help you write your code. We always recommend students to have this open side by side so that, you know, in case they're forgetting, you know, how to use a specific table method, it's right there for them and there's examples. Next up, um, there's also recommended reading, which takes you to the Data8 textbook and so on. And then also, we have a lab queue. So we actually have an online system that when students have questions during lab, um, either the TA or an academic intern, which academic interns had just recently taken the course, they want to go into teaching, they're there as support for the lab. Either the TA or an academic intern will go up to a student, you know, like, how can I help? Like, let's talk about this problem and so on. So definitely we have a lot going on in labs, but it's primarily all there to make sure we're getting students to understand the concepts. Okay. So before I go through a little quick walkthrough, does anyone have any quick questions about how we run like the lab regarding anything that we're going to do right now? Yes. Um, so uh, can you speak to uh, at all um, going over the discussion section um, for the lab worksheet of motivating students to do the worksheet if it's not technically something to turn it in? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So when it comes, so the question was like, how do we actually motivate students to work on the lab worksheets when it's not being submitted? Is that correct? Yeah. So for us, um, typically we don't really have much of an issue, right? That right, like, oh, okay. Oh. You mentioned it briefly. Um, so we actually have a specific attendance policy where students can either turn in the lab before their um, assigned lab or they can attend their assigned lab for the full duration of the discussion worksheet portion um, and finish their lab 
for full points. Um, so let's say that they do decide to show up to their assigned lab. They have to sit through the, the discussion portion of the worksheet. Um, and then the second hour is designated for that lab portion. Um, and then if they show up and if they attend the discussion worksheet part, they don't actually have to finish the lab. Um, because we kind of have them there for two hours, and we know that they're paying attention to the discussion worksheet and that they've tried their best in the lab, then we give them full points. Um, and that motivates them to actually do the discussion worksheet because they're not focused on finishing the lab in a sense. Any other quick question you can answer? Yes. Um, pedagogically, you have been doing some group discussion during the worksheet portion. During the lab portion, they are on their own, on their own computers. Yeah. So the question was like for the how do we compare the discussion worksheet or how do we teach pedagogically the discussion worksheet versus the lab notebook? So to answer this question, the lab worksheet itself is definitely very class oriented. So we try to make sure that the TA is leading all of it. When, it come, when we finish that and we move on to the second hour, which is the lab notebook itself, we try to give students more independence to actually try to work on it. So either if students wanna work on it by themselves, that's okay, but we always highly encourage pair programming or working with another student. So if you ever do feel lost, like you always ask each other questions or like even working in a group, like we don't really like worry about like students copying other students because you know, there's always staff um, walking around, we're always asking students, do you have any questions? Is there anything you want to talk about? So we actually don't really worry about that that much, but we do try to give students a little bit more independence when it comes to the lab notebook. Yeah. Another question? Yeah. How do you coordinate PS programming online? Yeah, great question. So the question was, how do we coordinate peer programming online? So to add to this, um, I also taught on Zoom for about uh, almost a year. Did you? No. Okay. So yeah, when it comes to online, it's definitely very difficult. Um, at least for us, what we try doing is set up breakout rooms for independent students, whether they want to have two students, three students, four students, like we definitely try to get feedback from the students and we change it over time, depending on their needs. Um, yeah. But online, like the only option that we use was just Zoom. Another quick question yes. before we move on. Actually, two quick questions. Uh, okay. I'm going to start with you. I think it's similar to UCSD. They do three hours of lecture and the weekend they do two hours of lab before they do their uh, pictures and they work for the discussion and the comic uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh, My second question was uh, the lab and so on the discussion, you have a context, you have a real life data that you go over. Lab, is it based on that context or have nothing to do with that context? Oh, no, definitely. So the question is like, how do the context of the labs compare to basically the structure of the course? So students are expected to attend lecture. Um, from lecture, these lab worksheets typically cover what's from the previous week. So we reinforce that content with the lab worksheet and then also the lab notebook builds on that. So everything is meant to be connected in that singular lab. You're not learning two different things between the worksheet and the notebook, but rather it's meant to be the same thing. Just you're doing more conceptual understanding in the lab worksheet and then just, you know, how could we actually apply the code in the lab notebook itself? So if they really want to be successful, they have to attend the discussion. Otherwise, the lab would be just rough manipulation of code without understanding what they're looking for. In a sense, yes. But students could still make connections without the lab worksheet. Yes. Okay, so sorry, we're gonna for the take of the time, we're gonna start continuing with the notebook itself. So for a really quick demo, um, let's say you're a student, right? You end up starting this Jupyter notebook. Um, you start at the top. So typically how we run this is if you hit shift enter, it will run the cell for you. So typically that's what we'll end up telling students for the beginning. If you want to run a cell, um, you hit shift enter. We have two different cells in Jupyter Notebooks, one being markdown, which is wherever you see any of the text, and then code cells, which is where you see any of the code. So what we do, we always make sure they run the first cell, make sure they're able to load up all of the, like the auto grader, the data science package, and so on, and then just the essentials of Python. Um, what we try to introduce also using Markdown is just like a really brief recap of what they're able to do with the code. Um, so here with number one, review the building blocks of Python code. So here it says, the two building blocks of Python code are expression of statements and expression is a piece of code. It is self-contained and then usually evaluates to a value. So, you know, giving students just a refresher on that content before we just throw them into questions, right? Because if we just throw them into questions, sometimes they might, miss some of those questions or some of those conceptual understandings of like a topic as a whole. So that's what we try to make sure that we always do. 
one thing before I continue that I just noticed is if you see, it says no kernel at the top, right? If you see that you have that too, there are two solutions to this problem. And usually this is where students get really confused. So no kernel basically means you weren't touching your Jupyter notebook for a while. So it shuts down to save like energy and like resources, right? So two ways to fix this, either you could refresh your page or what I like to do is if you hit up kernel at the top and then restart, it should say kernel restarting and then now connected. One of the issues with this is that some of your, like your code will be saved, everything will be saved, but some of the cells that you ran above won't be loaded anymore. So typically we tell students, make sure you load, rerun everything from the top. So if I were a student doing this, I'd make sure I come up back here to the top, hit shift enter, and then start running the cells again. So a lot of this is meant for students to read at their own pace, right? We try to give students some more independence to either work on these notebooks by themselves or working in groups. And, you know, encouraging them to work together and talk about these concepts before moving on to the problems. So for example, when we head over here to question 1.1, um, it's just like in the next cell, assign the name year to the larger number among the following two numbers. So when we do this, right, it's basically telling us use the absolute value function and then also check the max between both of these two different evaluations. Um, so then this is basically just showing students like, you know, what concepts could, or like, how could we apply what we just read right now, right? Because it shows us different functions and it tells us the descriptions. How could we use these tools? So that's how a lot of these notebooks are set up. Here's a brief intro about the tools. Let's apply these tools into questions. Okay, so moving on. Um, in this second lab notebook, we also teach students how to like, you know, import code. So what does it mean when you see import data science, import math, like what are these packages? What are these tools? So we also make sure that like, you know, if we're introducing any topics that weren't really covered in class, like in the data eight class itself, we don't really say, here's how you import a package. Here's how, here's what it does, right? Because that's not quite essential for the needs of like the data science toolkit, right? So we just do brief introductions whenever it's needed in these Jupyter notebooks, whether it be the lab itself or until the homework actually. So it really does depend. Um, so that's what this second question is aiming to do, basically just importing code, like what does it mean? And then how could we see it in the real world, right? So if I click on the cell, it says import math, radius is equal to five, area of a circle is the radius squared um, times math.pi, and then it gives us the area of a circle with a radius of five. So a lot of this is just giving the students examples before the problems themselves so that they can actually see for themselves what is an expected answer of what the question is asking for. I think that's probably one of the most important parts of these lab notebooks that we give students examples before throwing them into problems. Otherwise, it's just going to be a lot of confusion, a lot of questions, and really removing that, you know, that individual aspect of being able to learn on your own. I feel like that's the most empowering part, like you yourself to learn. Like you don't need someone to babysit you or you don't need someone to be there by your side all the time. Okay, so we try to debrief that a little bit. Talk about that. Let's say you're still a student. Um, question 2.1, so how could we actually end up using these functions themselves? So first we introduce the topic and then it's now, how could we use it? So for example, if we go into this question 2.1 accessing functions, in the question above, you access variables within the math module. Modules are also, also defined functions. For example, math provides the name floor for the floor function. So one thing here in data A is whenever we talk about variables, we typically use the term name. Um, having imported math already, we can write math.floor 7.5 to compute the floor of 7.5. So now question 2.1.1, we're asking students compute the floor of pi using floor and pi for the math module and give the result for the name floor. So, um, for example, if I were the student, okay, so I'm being told about the floor function, which was just shown to me an example. So I know I want to put something along the lines of math.floor. Okay, so we try to give a little bit of hints here and there so that students have some idea and also an example of what to work with. So the example provided was that we just had 7.5. However, now we want to use the number pi itself. So as we ended up learning from up above, if I want to use pi, then there I have a previous example that I could connect back to where I actually ended up using math.pi. So now let's hit math.pi. We run the cell and it gives us our answer. So then now students want some form of immediate feedback, right? I'm pretty sure we're all used to it. Like, did I do this question correctly? That's what we have the auto grader for. So when it comes to the lab notebooks, the auto grader will make sure that the question is fully correct. If it's not correct and we have an issue, it will spit out an error 
um, these are public tests for the students to see. When it comes to the homework assignments, there's also hidden tests that the students don't see to make sure that they actually ended up getting it correct. And that's how we try to make the homework assignments a little bit more fair, but the lab assignments definitely a lot more accessible with immediate feedback. So for example, your student, you ran that cell, and then now the next cell says greater dot check question 211. Run it, and it seems like we have an error here. So it's gonna say, uh, oh, it seems like we have an error. And basically it's just telling us like how, oh, this is not my fault, I think. Oh, so see here, it's telling me grader's not defined, so I think I just didn't run a cell above. Um, so let's initialize it. I think we should be fine now. Running cells out of order can be a problem. Yes. <laughs> Question 211 passed. So that's a really great part of working on these lab notebooks with students that like they want the immediate feedback. Um, and typically when a student will end up coming to you for or coming to a TA for help, um, it's usually when they don't pass the test. So usually first step that we tell students, you know, talk to other students, see if any other students also ran into the same issue or are they able to help you first? So, you know, giving students some peer to peer feedback. And if not, then call over someone like we're here to support you. And we try to make sure we always set up that environment that we're one step away. And typically we don't wait for students to ask us questions. Rather, we actually walk around and, you know, like, hey, do you have any questions? Like, oh, I see you're working on this question. Like, how's it going? Like making sure that you're feeling like that students feel like you're there for them. That definitely helps a lot. And then from what Ciara and I know from um, a program that we definitely that we help develop here at Berkeley, one of the most important things for the TA is making sure the TA or the lab assistants are always addressing students by their names. That's always the most important part. Like if you're like a student typically doesn't feel like you're there for them if you don't know for if you don't know their name. Okay. So this is basically the fundamentals of building up the tables. And then now that we actually get to take question number three, now it's the table operations themselves. So this is now building off of what Professor Dinero was showing us earlier in the table demo. So one of the first examples that students come up with is this farmersmarket.csv table. So we actually do use real world data here when it comes to practice problems. Like when it comes to the lab worksheets or maybe in lecture, we might use some toy examples here or there that much smaller data sets that we create ourselves. But we want to empower students from the beginning to make to know that they are able to start working with real world data. So that's what this farmers market.csv is. I believe it's just like farmers markets um, across the United States and like different attributes and information about them. So for here, question number three is telling us the table farmers market.csv contains data from farmer mar farmers markets in the United States data associated with the USDA. So that's another important aspect. If we are ever using real world data, we always wanna make sure we link the source of the data so students could access it themselves. Otherwise they don't know where that data is coming from. And you know, it, it touches on this whole idea of accessibility and like, you know, can I trust this data? So what is the source? So here it says, run the next cell to load the farmer's market table. There will be no output. No output is expected as the cell contains an assignment statement and assignment statement does not produce any output. So we always try to introduce those like quick and brief reminders of like what is actually happening when you run a cell and we provide that cell for you. So just telling the student, run the cell. Okay, so now we start getting to the basics of table, right? So starting with the very pre preliminary stuff. So question 3.1, use the method show to display the first five rows of the farmer's market table. So the show method for tables, essentially just, you know, if you wanna see a certain number of rows from the table, whether that be the first five rows or the first 10 rows, we would wanna use the table method show. So it tells us here as a hint, table.show of three will show the first three rows of the table named TBL. So TBL is always like the placeholder that we use. And if you recall from the Python reference, which I will open up here, Everything here to the left that you see, it always says TBL, but we replace that with whatever table name we end up using, which in this case is farmer's market. We have a question? Yes, but the farmer's market table, is that part of the data science module? No, so we ended up, uh, sorry, the question is, um, is the farmer's market table part of the data science module? No, we use the data science module to load the farmer's market CSV as a table. Oh. Yeah, so it's not built into the Python package. Okay. So I guess to clarify this question a little bit more, when we run the cell farmers market is equal to table.readtable farmers market.csv. This CSV is already uploaded to the Jupyter Hub for students. Yes. 
Yes, yeah. So it's already uploaded to the GitHub repository. From there, the link uploads it for the student. So it's just super easy for the student to just, you know, type in farmersmarket.csv and it loads. Yeah, great question. Okay, so if I'm a student and I want to work on this problem, table.show doesn't need any assignments. It just basically needs to run into a cell. So let's call farmers market and do dot show. And this question is telling us that we want to show the first five rows. So that's all we need to write. Farmers market dot show five. Run the cell, and we get all of our data. So it's really cool for students to actually work with this real-world data because they can see that you know from you know your first two lectures you're already empowered enough to be able to access the data and start with some basic manipulation. So there's definitely a lot for students to work with, and you know, for a student for the first time to see such a large data set, a lot of things that go on in their mind is. What am I supposed to do with this? Why is there so much data? What exactly am I supposed to do with it? So that's what we try to break down with the questions. Like, let's select some rows. You only need some rows. Let's select some columns. You only need some of them. Let's, you know, ignore some of the data. We only want we only have specific questions, so we only want the data for those specific questions. Um, yeah. So here we end up introducing other table methods. So for example, here we want to. Like this is covered in lecture already, but you know we want to reintroduce it to the students, make sure that they didn't forget. So for here we have dot num rows. So what dot num rows does is it's a table method that takes a table name, you hit dot, you put dot num columns afterwards or dot num rows afterwards, and it's just going to spit out a number to you, which is the total number of columns or the total number of rows. So again, right? As although we're learning these really important concepts, we really emphasize breaking them down little by little. So we have um, a question on num columns, check if it's correct, a question on num rows, check if that's correct, a question on dot select. So what dot select does is you put the column names of all the columns that you would want in a new table. So what dot select does, it makes a copy of the table, but only with the columns that you specified in the parameters. Um, similarly, or you know, contrastly, I guess, we have drop, which is basically, I want all of the columns in my table replicated, However, I only want to remove some of the columns that might not have necessary information. So this, these two, although they're very similar, they're very important if we have a large data set, right? So I only want to select some versus I only want to drop some. Um, we also have another table method called dot sort. So if I have a specific column, let's say I have like um, the revenues for all of these farmer markets and I want to know which farmer, farmer's market has the highest revenue. Well, one thing that I could do is I could do farmer's market dot sort put the column name of revenue and then sort it either descending is equal to true or descending is equal to false to give us that highest number at the top or if I want the highest number at the bottom. So a lot of this is like, although the students learned this in class, um, there's still many examples for them to read at their own pace and then, you know, try to experiment and work with it. And again, right, the immediate feedback of the auto grader is probably one of the most important things for the students. Um, but yeah, essentially the whole lab, um, for the sake of time, I'm just trying to go through them. We have dot where and so on. Um, dot where is essentially like, you know, I'm looking for a specific value of a specific column. So I want to see if it's equal to, not equal to, above, is it below, and so on. And then from there, um, question number, so question number three, although it's still a large data set, it's meant to be more exploratory for the students. So as you saw here, they're just very basic questions of like, can you select these rows? Can you drop these rows? Can you sort the table by this specific row and these this order of values? So then we always try to give that smaller example first to the students in the lab notebooks. And then as you see here, we have question number four, analyzing a data set. And it's introduced using the IMDB data set, which if you're not familiar with it, it's basically a data set of like all of the movies that have been released um, for like a time frame of years. So if I load the IMDB data set here, so for the student here, um, the table is read in. So again, this data set is pulled um, for the course of data eight, but it's uploaded to the GitHub. And then so it's very easy for students just to run this line of code and it just works. So there you go. We run the cell and then the student is able to see the code or the table of the IMDB data set. Um, and then, yeah. So basically it's just a couple short questions, you know, making sure that students have the ability to manipulate the data set itself. And then we always try to end all of these lab notebooks with some sort of summary of like, what did the student actually learn? And sometimes we try to introduce a question here or there that really summarizes every single concept that they learned in the lab notebook to see if they could apply them all together because these are meant to be connected topics so that students are able to do, you know, much greater and much work with much bigger problems. 
And then, yeah, as Ciara ended up mentioning earlier, um, one of the things about our lab attendance policy is that there's also the opportunity if you attended in person, then you get checked off and you get checked off whether you finish the lab notebook or not. But as always, we always encourage the students to finish the lab notebooks for their own benefit. Um, but that is all. And then we always introduce pictures of like animals. <laughs> But yeah, thank you for listening. Um, are there any questions I could answer? Yes. Class, or do you have, have this like policy where we only do public um, checks or tests? Um, I noticed one of the later laws, um, there's some kind of like manually or questions that don't need to be anticipated. They decided to like do a PT ram or whatever, but there weren't. Um, like yeah great question so the question that we had now was about the public and the hidden tasks for the labs versus also other assignments in the course so when it comes to the lab itself the public tests are pretty much for all of the coding questions, right? As we saw, we run a self code, could we check if it's correct? That's all public for the lab notebooks themselves. However, there are some written questions in the lab notebooks that um, we actually don't grade. Like we don't look at them, but we always have like some little thing written there that's like, oh, check with the lab TA, check with the lab assistant, um, check with your peers, like what answers did you get? So although we're not giving them feedback in the grading of the lab notebook for some of those written answers, we still encourage some form of getting it checked first um, versus a lot of the other data eight assignments. Like let's say you're working on the lab homework for tables. Um, there's the public test that's basically just checking like, did you actually output a table and is your table these five rows that we asked for? But the private test or the hidden test could be like, is the data in those five rows actually correct? And is this actually the correct table? So that's what we mean between the hidden and the private test so that, you know, we're giving students some form of feedback, but not like, you know, getting them the answer. Yeah, and then we'll, also like we'll cover okay. this a little bit more when we'll go into honor in a little bit. That's a really quick question. Do you have any stats on which attendance choice the students make for the last? I so the question is, do we have any statistics on the lab choice for students? It really does depend on the students. Some students um opt to just like complete the lab on their own, and it might be that they have prior coding experience. Um, but in my own experience, like both CR and I, we taught a program called Data Scholars, and we always, a lot of the students don't have prior coding experience. Like we assume far from it and we have like very high attendance. So it really does depend on the needs of the students. Yeah, and it's totally also this funny thing, like some students just mail everything in. Like they never come to lecture, they never come to lab, and there's any way to like just stay in their bedroom for their whole college experience, they would do that. And I joke, but that's just like a shift in American higher education. And other people really get something out of in-person and they meet Carlos, they become friends with Carlos, and he supports them. And he'll talk about scholars a little bit later, but you know, there's a, there's a lot of diversity in how people get their choices. Yes, question. I have a question for both of you. Uh, how does your exam and midterm look like? Uh, do they have a lot of lab component also into the incorporated into the midterm and exam uh, and the final exam? Yeah, so all of our tests are actually on paper just because it makes it a lot. Oh, sorry. Let me repeat the question. Um, the question was about whether our labs and our tests, sorry, our tests and our midterms are in the same format or use the labs. Okay, perfect. Um, so we actually have all of our exams on paper um, because all of our exams are, um, with the exception of COVID, in person. And having all of the students um, on laptops could be kind of hard to proctor. So all of our tests are on paper. Um, we do sometimes um, make the note that we might ask questions about certain labs or certain assignments or even certain lectures but they do not ever use a Jupyter notebook. Um, so this program right here, um, when they're taking a test. Um, yeah, so we definitely use paper for all of them. It's really intended to like, you know, you learned how to code on a computer. Like, could we do it on paper, right? Like that's difficult. That's definitely the hardest challenge for students, but that's how we intend to work on it. Some of the questions have the students write the code on paper. Yes, and majority of the questions. <laughs> Yeah, so, but as they can have a cheat sheet. Yeah, so, well, not necessarily a cheat sheet, but we always give students the Python reference sheet. So as I linked here, right, 
this entire Python reference sheet is printed for the students. So like if they, for, like, you know, we don't expect students to memorize all of these table methods. It's so difficult to memorize all this and it takes away from the learning of the specific topic, right? These are tools, not the topic that we want students to learn. So for these tools, we print it out on the Python reference sheet. Every single student has access to it during an exam so that they're not feeling pressured. Obviously like memorizing helps a little because you are able to work faster, but we always try to level the playing field for everyone. Okay, I want to segue to the next part. So can we give it up? Yeah. Big thanks for this video. And then we'll uh, start off we'll come back in the afternoon and talk about data scholars, which is an important effort of like how do we get people involved in the project? Okay, this is the flash mob part of the workshop where people are gonna come out of the of the audience and they're gonna come up and they're gonna tell you about how they taught data eight at their school. So Sharon. Brian, Suraj, Mahmoud, can you guys come up? Look, they're sitting amongst you and they've been teaching data eight, not data eight specifically, they've been teaching their class. Come on over here by the microphone. Um, Suraj, can you come up? And uh, I'm gonna have everybody sort of like give a quick intro. Uh, and this is so great. It's like first time I'm meeting you in person. Um, uh, so they can give a quick intro of what their class is like, and then maybe after the four of them go, you guys could save your questions to sort of uh, discuss. So, uh, hello, my name is Sharon Solis. I'm a lecturer at UC Santa Barbara. Um, I teach the Data 8 curriculum. We're a quarter system, so we split it into two quarters. Um, we started it in about fall 2019. Um, I started teaching it in 2021. Um, so I've taught it about um, maybe like half a dozen times. Uh, so I can speak a little bit about that, the quarter system, um, kind of the infrastructure we built, the teaching team, managing all the TAAs, um, undergraduate tutors, and um, uh, just some of the uh, customizations we've we've made. Brian, um, hi, I'm I'm Brian Kim. I'm an assistant research professor at the University of Maryland. I'm also co-director of a new um, major called social data science. Um, I developed a course called um, uh, Data Science for Social Sciences, taking a lot of the stuff from Data 8, kind of adapting it for a social science audience. Um, and so um, adapting uh, some of the examples, um, including some separate, uh, some different examples, um, changing some of the topics a little bit, but a lot of the same structure of the, the Data 8 course. And um, this is one of the courses that's uh, going to be a core course in the, the new major that we're developing. Um, and so uh, so, so the social data science major um, would, will, will be launching, kind of officially launching fall 2022. Um, so we're really excited about that. Um, yeah, so basically kind of one of the things that we're working on is kind of improving the infrastructure of data science education within the social sciences. Um, so I'm a statistician by training, but I'm kind of in the uh, College of Behavioral and Social Sciences right now um, and trying to kind of really improve the infrastructure for teaching data science, you know, within the classroom and also support outside of the classroom as well. Um, and kind of, you know, taking a lot of the lessons learned from uh, stuff like data aid and, and kind of all the connected courses and all that kind of stuff to um, kind of develop more of a, a data science curriculum. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Mahmoud Harding and I teach at the North Carolina School of Science and Math in Durham, North Carolina. It's a residential public high school for students in grade 11 and 12. Students throughout North Carolina apply for admission and the student body is made up of uh, equal proportions of students from the different congressional districts. Myself and my head of department, Taylor Gibson, we've been teaching data science for about three years. We started with the data eight curriculum and that's our introductory course. We made some modifications to adapt to high school students and we kind of remixed the materials to make them more North Carolina centric. <laughs> and we have a second course that is adapted from the data 100 course. And the same kind of theory applies. We remixed it to make it more North Carolina century. So currently myself, Taylor Gibson, uh, Amber Smith, and Floyd Bullard, we all teach the data science course. And next year we'll mark our 
fourth time teaching it residentially and as an online course offered free to students in North Carolina. Right now, going forward into next year, our, we intentionally made the course a place for students who had no prior programming experience and no experience in statistics to make it as open as possible. We like to call it a gateway course for programming, for statistics, and for our discrete course. Next semester, I'm working with two students on a forum for research in data science. This forum will address the needs of our students that are more advanced mathematically and in terms of programming so that we have an offering for them as well. Hey everyone, I'm Suraj Rampure. Um, I am a lecturer in data science at UC San Diego, though I was at Berkeley for five years before that. Um, so UCSD started to adopt Berkeley's data science curriculum back in 2017, way before I was involved there. Uh, but the, the you know, most similar course is DSC-10, which is uh, our adoption of Berkeley's Data 8. Now there are some big differences like UC Santa Barbara uh, and all other, most other UCs, I think. Uh, UCSD is on the quarter system, and so we can't teach all of the content in Data 8. And so the notable omission there uh, is classification, but most of the rest of the Data 8 curriculum is taught in our DSC-10. Uh, one of the other big changes uh, that was made a few years ago um, was that DSC-10 at UCSD doesn't use the data science module. Rather, it uses a module called Baby Pandas, uh, which is a subset of pandas uh, that sort of replicates the behavior of the data science module. Um, and so I'd be happy to chat about that uh, if you're interested. Uh, we also have a full data science major. And just uh, a few weeks ago, we had the commencement for our third graduating class. Uh, so I'd also be happy to chat about you know, the other courses in our major, lower division and upper division, uh, the similarities and differences between you know, our curriculum and you know, other places' curriculums. Uh, cool. Uh, do we want to go to questions or do we want to go to, uh, should I be moderating? <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, so I'll go one. I'll go one starter question. What's a key thing that you needed to change from day to eight? Like, what's uh, something you needed to adapt? I. Oh yeah. Uh, or at least <laughs> to the owl, most important. Yeah. Um. I I think one of the key things that I changed. Um. And 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 I I don't think this was something that was necessarily. It, uh, yeah, I mean, one of the key things that I changed was kind of some of the data examples. So one of the examples that I use is that I really like is um, this uh, series of surveys that Cards Against Humanity used, uh, like sent out, and basically it's called like the Pulse of the Nation survey. Um, it has like questions like, um, you know, like demographic questions, age, sex, et cetera. Um, has some questions about like, like income and stuff like that. And then it also has some questions like, oh, you know, what do you think about the... Uh, I don't know, like election fairness and stuff like that. And then also has some silly questions, stuff like how many Transformers movies have you at watched in the past year and things like that. And so it, it's been a kind of a fun, one of the things I liked about it was, you know, it was basically it's a survey. Um, and one of the things that we wanted to expose students to was looking at survey data, because uh, that's for social sciences, that's uh, important for a, a lot of social sciences. And then, um, but it, you know, had some stuff that they're going to see a lot like demographics it's present in a lot of surveys. Um, but also had kind of the fun questions that students had exposure to. Um, so, so they really liked that too. So um, like the data examples was one. I tried to incorporate kind of some of the um, like human context centric stuff in there as well. Um, this is again, data science for social sciences. The you know, unit of observation should be the person. Um, you know, it's really focusing on you know, how does this impact people, um, the human context. So um, that's, that's kind of one of the main big changes that I made to um, uh, um, so at UC Santa Barbara, um, we did we did do a couple of things. Um, let's see. So localized data sets. Um, so the big one, um, and kind of the easiest one was that is the compensation data set um, that's covered later on in the maybe in the middle of the course, whether you're thinking about the semester model or a quarter model maybe towards the end of the first course. Um, so the compensation data, we 
We did our own class data set as well. We um, did write new projects. We did away with exams, um, no which exams. I'm no exams, um, just notebook, just, uh, just labs, homeworks. We did write our own projects, uh, made them um, a little bit more open ended, guided them through generating their own, um, doing their own hypothesis testing, uh, possibly choosing from uh, a, a collection of data sets. So, and we did also introduce oral presentations of the, um, of the final project. So we did this for a number of reasons. So we did do away with exams, just with my own kind of um, way of teaching. Um, but the other thing we did find with labs and homework assignments was kind of this cheating exact replicas of the solutions and the master notebooks. And so um, just kind of talking with other advisors, um, we did introduce an oral presentation of their final project. It is very casual. It's one-on-one -on -one with the student and one of the teaching staff. Um, we tell, we ask, we do give them sample questions. We give them um, a good framework of how they will be graded based on the learning outcomes of the course. Um, and I think with the new uh, projects that we try to write, maybe once a year, uh, maybe every two quarters, um, and that is quite um, labor intensive on, on part of the TAs or the undergraduate staff. Um, so, um, and then for, since we do split it into two classes for a quarter system, and it's not a, they can get an approval code to enter in the second part, really chapter 12 to 18, starting with AV testing. Um, let's say they took a, a straight comp sci intro to Python, we do, and then going into this class, if they wanna get kind of some statistical and uh, uh, just uh, knowledge and exposure, then we do do, I think we use your midterm lab worksheet um, to prepare to, as a review assignment, as a first assignment for the second um, course uh, in the series. Um, and then like the last thing is, I think because I started teaching it in COVID to create community and to try to create connections with the teaching staff and the students, we did use Flipgrid, which is like TikTok for education, um, just to get like some face face to face kind of contact with students, showing their personality. So that's really fun, and we still use that um, to reflect on what they've learned in the past week or two, uh, reflect on how it connects with their own interests. Um, and then maybe even kind of um, practice teaching a concept that they learned so far in the course to like a little a, a younger sibling or to a family member, a neighbor type of thing. Um, so Flipgrid is great for like, you know, 30 seconds to 90 second um, uh, short video. So is this, these two courses part of a major? So do you have to yeah, so we are not part of a major. We are working on kind of um, adding it as a G general and general education elective. Um, we are working on for it to be equivalent on various major sheets. We don't have a data science department. We're currently we're currently kind of offered between um, the computer science department, statistics department, um, that data eight that data eight and kind of data one hundred kind of curricula curriculum being offered between those two departments. Um, so our efforts is to, our goal is to offer a data science department um, and maybe it's on major, but currently that's not, um, does not exist. So just like the others have mentioned, we localize data sets. We also have what we call quick checks. These are after each lesson where students can answer questions that are embedded in our learning management system canvas. We also have skills quizzes where the students take these quizzes after they learn specific programming functions in the different packages that we use. We don't have any final exams. Everything is project-based. 
Uh, this year, we introduced some more open-ended questions in the projects and in the lab uh, and in some of the assignments. And we also do great assignments where they have to work in groups, uh, analyze some data, come up with some presentations and present. Yeah, I, I'm, I don't want to say, like, I don't want to answer the question, what changes did you make to adopt? Because I didn't do any of the adoption. I was a student here when they were adopted. But uh, I, like I said, the biggest difference is the use of baby pandas over the data science module. Um, and so quarter. the, pardon? And quarter. Yeah, and then quarter system. Um, though I think a difference between the UCSD approach and the UC Santa Barbara approach from what I'm hearing is that we don't have a, sort of like, it's still just one course and the material that we had to chop off going from semester to quarter is dispersed throughout other courses, but there's not like a direct follow on. Uh, so the way that DSC 10 is positioned in our major is that it's the intro course. And then after students take DSC 10, they take a two quarter sequence on programming. So there's one course in Python and then one course in Java. And then they take a two quarter sequence on some of the more theoretical uh, you know, aspects to data science. So one course is on, you know, statistics and empirical risk minimization, uh, and another course is on algorithms. And then after they take all of those courses, so those five, they then take like uh, a practical data science course that uses pandas uh, and that allows them to leverage what they learned uh, in baby pandas. Um, I think some of the other changes that have been made over the years are the projects. So we tend to write new projects quite often. Like I think this year, you know, this is my first year at UCSD, but we made six new projects this year in the three times we taught it. Um, probably unnecessary, but I enjoy doing it. Um, the homeworks have also been changed significantly, though the lab assignments uh, are more or less the same, though, as others have mentioned, a lot of examples have changed from Berkeley to San Diego, but uh, there's that, uh, yeah. I guess one other thing I'll mention is that we don't have a lab section the same way that Data 8 does. So labs are assignments uh, and we, we offer plenty of office hours for students to come and get help, but there's no like dedicated lab section where students come and work with their TA. So that's another big difference. Uh, classes include some like those lab or the classes are all big? Uh, so the, the lectures themselves, have notebooks and they have like a few embedded questions that students discuss uh, while they're there, uh, but they are, you know, tra they're traditional lecture sections. Yeah. So if you write a course that articulates the data in that you see in Berkeley, would we have a problem of articulation with this? My understanding is no, but I think Eric would know that better. Uh. <laughs> Because ideally, yeah, hopefully, yes. Like the point, that's why we're all here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I haven't been that involved in the articulation discussions, but from what I can remember, whenever a course articulated to data eight, we would also count it as a system. Yeah. Yeah. So, does baby pandas and reimplementation of their or? Yeah. Yeah. So it. It's a subset of pandas. So all code that they write in baby pandas is valid pandas code, but the only code that works in baby pandas is the stuff that already works in data science. And so like, you know, if you've used pandas before, you'll know that there are like 300 ways of doing the most basic thing, like accessing a call, for instance, right? And so we just picked, I mean, not we again, the people who created it, picked one way of doing everything, everything that you could do in data science, and then you could do that in pandas. Uh, University of Maryland. Okay. There are multiple universities in Maryland. Uh, College Park. <laughs> <laughs> no, but there's some Baltimore County. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 I just have a demo question for all of you. Uh, at your institution, uh, so initially they can start out by saying here at Berkeley, the course is co taught by the community. That's the step of this person and some of the CS department, right? So is that how it works at your institution where you have one instructor? Can you just whisper the... Yeah, so to repeat the question, it was, 
at Berkeley, the spirit was that data eight was always co-taught by someone from primarily a statistics background and a computer science background. Does that remain true uh, at the adopters universities uh, or institutions? So at the North Carolina School of Science and Math, the first two people to teach the course were myself and Taylor Gibson, and we're in the math department. And we added on other people in the math department to teach the course. But we've opened a new campus in a different location in North Carolina. And part of the requirements for being at that location is that everyone will have to take this course. So Taylor is doing a training session to train everyone there on how to teach this course. We also have a digital humanities course that we're starting. So for us, we believe that the collaboration between multiple departments only strengthens the course because one of the ways to make it interesting is to have insight from different perspectives. And if it's my course, it'll just be all the things that I like. And <laughs> maybe everybody doesn't like those things, but then when you start implementing ideas from other courses in the different sciences and the humanities department, then every student can have at least a moment or time in the class where there's something that speaks to their particular interest. Um, so when I've uh, taught this course, um, it's uh, mostly just been like me, um, it, which is really hard. Um, you really wanna have, uh, the, the co-taught model I think is uh, a really good model. Um, one of the big challenges with the first time was just kind of the infrastructure and the environment and everything. I had to do everything with setting up the um, Jupyter Hub environment. Um, I used AWS and I got some later on, I got some IT help and stuff like that. But, um, you know, setting all that up. And so I'm, I'm coming from statistics. So I'm coming from the statistics side. Um, and yeah, basically, um, you know, thinking about teaching like the programming and all that kind of stuff. So um that was one of the big challenges is that you know there it's just kind of i was doing all trying to do all the parts by myself um or I, I will say um i think there was a plug earlier for like somebody hiring 15 people for um their program uh for our social data science um major we're, we're trying to hire a, a person that's kind of on the computer science side uh, to help with this um so um so that's my plug for one because i only need one person <laughs> yes uh, just one question. Do students take a statistics or a computer science course before they come into you? Um, that's a good question. So uh, if they change their majors, so so right now, since we're launching a major, we're having a lot of change of majors. And so they're coming from different places. And so they might have taken previous computer science courses or statistics courses. Um, in terms of the sequence of the courses, they take, um, they don't, necessarily have to have taken like a, a previous programming course for the data science for social sciences um but but they might have um and this is also one of the challenges i think of teaching this course is that you know i, I have students who take the course they turn in all their assignments in pandas and i'm like okay well that i guess um that's okay but um but that's just because that's what they know already um, i have students who all want to do this hypothesis test and they, they are like we, we know the central limit theorem we want to do hypothesis but well we're not doing it that way and so and just kind of trying to teach to different audiences and stuff like that um yeah um in the way the, the major is structured they also take a statistics course within a specific discipline like you know so they choose a disciplinary track like economics sociology um anthropology um, there's, there's a bunch of them um, and then uh, they, they take kind of the discipline statistics course, as well as other kind of uh, programming courses as well. Um, this is kind of one of the, the kind of main courses that tries to tie everything together. Um, so tying together like the programming and the uh, disciplinary statistics and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Hope that answers your question. Great. Thank you. Anybody else want to say something about prereqs? Do you have prereqs? We have no prereqs. Our yeah. course, we yeah. welcome anyone who gets accepted to the School of Science and Math has already completed algebra. Algebra. And so we don't have like, any prerequisites. In fact, we encourage people who've done nothing to take the course over the people who come in with ideas about what programming is already and about what statistics is already. And that is the our methodology. Yeah, I, I think um for us, like we really needed a class without prereqs for students in social science because uh, even if they're not within the, the major, it's they, you know, it might be the student economics wants to take some sort of data class. And so we need to have a course that doesn't have any prereqs for them, any programming or uh, prereqs for them. Yeah. 
I think that's a quick question for the very first summary. But a lot of you talk about projects in your class. So, uh, and as someone who loves project based pedagogy, I read a lot into it. And then one of the ways you can make it effective is a student to the context that they can relate to emotionally and uh, experientially and from their past experience. Uh, when you talk about the project, do you have a students find their own raw data that they're going to go through the whole analysis and do the analysis? And Raj, you said six projects. So I assume these projects are from other departments in UCSD who collect data about grants and what the master collect master data and do you have a student work on it? No, uh, of course. Uh, no, uh, it's just six, you know, like. If you were to adopt data eight, if you looked at project one or a project two, it's just six of those. But we chose the data sets. They're not open. Enough. I guess I didn't know. And okay. it's outside the scope of the, uh, the class as well of um, uh, doing the entire data science life cycle. That's maybe something more appropriate for data 100, uh, like an upper division course. We give them clean data so they don't have to spend the bulk of their time um, cleaning it up. And yeah. Yeah, but in our intro course, all of the assignments are sort of we decide the data sets and you know they're all auto graded, but in later courses our curriculum they're more open ended. Uh, the same for us. In the beginning course, the projects are projects that come from data eight, all the projects that we've done and made for the students. But we make the choice of the data and we really guide them through the process of what we want them to do. And our follow up course, the projects are a bit more open ended. And the final project, I choose for them about six or seven different data sets, depending on what the students in the class that they're interested in. Then they can choose those data sets and they have some requirements that they have to complete as they use the data set and work through their project. And the way I've structured mine was I have a midterm project that uses I like it, the Pulse of the Nation data set. And it's just specifically like looking at choose uh, one variable. And then and then look at it, the differences by political affiliation. Okay. So this is the midterm project. In the final project, I use kind of a different wave of the Pulse of the Nation survey. It has different questions, and it's more open-ended in the sense that they can choose any of the variables that I've provided. But I've kind of curated it a little bit, and chosen some ones that uh, look you know good, and kind of cleaned it up. Um, and so it's open-ended for within this one data set. What can you, you can look at uh, all any of the variables that I've uh, provided. Is your project a group project or individual project? Uh, for mine is individual. Uh, ours are individual as well. The, the question is, uh, um, are projects individual or group? And uh, we do use uh, partner, um, it, but it's optional. Yeah, in our course, uh, homeworks and labs are all individual, but projects we encourage pair work. All right, uh, so. Suraj, Mahmood, Brian, Sharon, they'll be around. You can ask them questions. Uh, you know, that's why we're here to like meet, learn from each other. Really different applications like tier one, high school, social science. Like we got really great context here. It's time for lunch. Yes. So my vision for lunch is that we're going to go through this hallway. And then once you get to that hallway, you can turn and then there's the sandwiches and, and like a LaCroix there. And then you can go outside. There's a bunch of tables outside. There's also another set of tables up at the top of the stairs. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe find somebody to go join a table with. Anything else, Anthony, that I need to announce? Yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you. Thanks to the panel. Yay, for the panel.